All right, now in John chapter 20, of course, John 19, we saw the, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and his death. And John chapter 20 is all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to go through, um, you know, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, a, a very popular, very common story. One, if you've been going to church, you should know the story. Um, even, even other Christian denominations, I mean, you, you know the general story of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. But um, what's really interesting, and we've done this in the past in, in the book of John, is looking at the different accounts that the Bible gives because we learn different pieces of information. So there's kind of quite a few things that happen. And sometimes it could even be a little bit confusing because of some of the events that are left out. So you might be reading you know, John chapter 20 and you're thinking, well, wait a minute, I, th I read this somewhere else and I don't understand how this matches up. Well, I went through and just took notes to get an order of events. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all have various elements of this, recordings of this day and the events that happened. And some include some things and not others. So I went through and I kind of patched them all together so we could get um, a timeline of the events as they happen. So if you want to keep your finger here, of course, John 20 is the second to last book. All of the other chapters, Matthew, it's going to be Matthew 28. Um, Mark's going to be Mark 16. It's the last chapter in those Gospels. Um, where, where we see the events of this day, of the resurrection. They all happen on the, in the last chapter. So let's flip back to Matthew 28 because we're going to start. In John 20, we don't see how the, um, the stone is removed from the sepulcher. It's just already removed by the time that we get to this point in the story here because it says that in verse 1, the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark under the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. So we see here that Mary comes. And it's interesting, too, because in John 20, it's only talking about Mary. And there's a reason for that. Mary's kind of a, a central focus within, in later in this chapter. She's, she's referred to again. But in some of the other um, accounts, you see that it was... Uh, Mary and Mary the mother, you know, there's there's a few women that had gone together, not just Mary Magdalene. But you can you can get the comprehensive understanding of what happened when you put them all together. And, and I, I encourage you to do this just in general, especially between the four Gospels. You learn a lot more when you can find the stories that relate and compare them together and you get a much fuller understanding. Because even in your daily Bible reading, you know, if you're reading just through, kind of like, like what I do is I read cover to cover the Bible. I start from Genesis and I end in Revelation. And I am on a cycle of just doing that with my family. It's our family Bible reading. And we go through that at least once a year, a little bit less than a year, to, to do the family Bible reading time of just getting through the Bible. So when you read Matthew, you know, you get through all the way to, to, to chapter 28, but then you start in Mark. So then by the time you get to, say, John 20, you know, these things aren't necessarily fresh in your mind. This is why it's important, you know, at times, you know, always do your, your regular Bible reading, but then take some time out to do some kind of studying because you'll learn more that way. And um, we're going to look tonight at, at some of these things. I've kind of chopped it up and, and we're going to see the order of events. And, you know, this takes a little bit of time to do, but it's really interesting. You can learn a lot from it. But um, let's look at, at, keep your finger here. We're going to be flipping around a little bit tonight. As we go through this, Matthew 28, verse 1, is we're going to see the first events that happen. Because the first thing that happens is the angel, the angel coming down and removing the stone from the sepulcher. Verse 1 of Matthew 28 says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of, of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment was white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. So if you remember, and again, this is from other accounts. We didn't go through this in John. But when Jesus died on the cross, 
Pilate was surprised that he had died so quickly. And, you know, one of the chief priests went to Pilate and said, hey, you know, that deceiver when he, when he was alive, you know, basically he said that he was going to rise again. And they knew that they, they heard him give the prophecy of his resurrection. So he says, basically what he said in a nutshell was, you know, let's, let's put some guards there to make sure that his disciples don't come and steal his body away to, to prove that, you know, he is the Christ. And then, and then he said, you know, the, our, the last error shall be worse than the first. So he's saying, you know, it'll be even worse for us that we put him to death if he actually is like gone from the grave. So they wanted to make sure that his disciples don't come and steal away his body and then start spreading rumors that, oh, he rose from the dead to give him that much more fame and that much more um, power in, the, in his teachings. So they do that. And they, they put a whole band of men to stand guard, just to keep watch over that, that tomb. And that's what we see here in Matthew 28, that when the angel comes down to roll that stone away from the door, they all get terrified and they shake and they become like dead men. And they're just like, like pretending they're asleep and dead and like they're not going to move because they're so terrified that this angel came down and is just, oh, I mean, they see this, it's happening. And um, they're terrified. And of course, they spread that rumor, you know, they go back and, and tell um, the chief priests about it. So then they start making up these lies and they're saying, you know, oh, well, say that you guys were asleep. They're like, make this story up and say, say that you were asleep and that his disciples came and stole the body away. And like, that's the, the story they came up. That's the lie they came up with when they said what really happened to the chief priests. They're like, okay, well, this is, and, and they're like, well, look, you know, we don't want to be held accountable for falling asleep on the job where you know, our job was to watch this. He's, and they're like, no, 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 we'll take care of it. You know, we'll make sure you don't get punished for this, but you need to tell people that the disciples came and stole the body while you were asleep. And that lie, and that lie is still being propagated today by people, by haters of Christ that don't want to believe that he was the Christ. They'll still say things like that, like, oh, it was all just put on by his disciples and it was all just a great deception. But it obviously wasn't true. And, um, we see here that that's the first thing that happens so on, this, on this morning. And it's before the, the dawn of the day. Jesus already was, was resurrected. He already rose from the dead before the first day of the week. He was already risen because they came before the dawn and the tomb was already opened and it was empty. And um, that's where we're at here. So the first part of the story is, is the angel coming down and the, and the men acting like dead men. Turn to Mark 16. We're going to see the next events. So the women are still there. The women are at the tomb. And the, the, the stone was rolled away, but they weren't quite there yet when the stone was rolled away. Because they show up and then they see that the, that the tomb is open. It says in, in Mark 16, look at verse 4. It says, And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And, and you know, the verse before that is saying that um, they were wondering who's going to open up the, the tomb for them because they knew it was real big, it was heavy, they weren't going to be able to do it. But they wanted to go, and because he died so quickly on the, you know, right before the Sabbath days, right before the, day, the, the, the feast day and the days of rest, they didn't have time to really like prepare his body properly. Now, Joseph of Arimathea and um, Nicodemus went and they prepared the body. But um, I don't even know. I mean, maybe Mary didn't, they, like these women might not have even known that. But they prepared spices. They prepared other things because they were going to go take care of the body now that the Sabbaths were over, now that they were able to do work again. So they went to the sepulcher and they were wondering, you know, who's going to open this up for us? But they didn't have to warn her about that very long because when they show up, it's already open. Let's re I keep reading here in verse number 5. It says, And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed and in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. So they see this man and they're scared. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted, ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There ye shall, ye shall, shall ye see him as he said unto you. 
So the angel basically tells him, look, he's not here. He's risen. Look at the place where he was. This is where he was. Now go. Go tell his disciples. Go back. Tell his disciples and, go and tell Peter, you know, that he's going to go before you into Galilee and he wants to meet up with you there. That's their message, right? So let's turn to Luke 24. Because now we're going to see they go, they go to tell the disciples. That's, that's the next thing that they do. The tombs open. The ladies show up. They see the tombs empty. The angel sends them out and says, okay, go, go tell them that Jesus is risen. Luke 24, look at verse number 10. The Bible says, It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women that were with them which told these things unto the apostles. So there were quite a few ladies that went there. Which is interesting because in John chapter 20, all we hear about is Mary Magdalene. We don't hear about any of the rest of them. But as you look at all the accounts, you start to get the full picture and say, oh, okay, well, and, and look, just because John 20 doesn't mention the other women, it doesn't make that account false. It doesn't mean that there's some problem or errors in the Bible. It just means that they weren't relevant to what John was, was describing in John 20. Everything that's in all of these accounts is completely accurate and completely truthful. We just get to learn it from different perspectives and they tell different aspects of the story. So, which again is the reason why we like to pull them all together so we can see everything. Say, okay, yeah, well, the story is that all of these ladies went to go help with the preparation of Jesus' body. The, the, the angel had already removed the stone. They go, they see the angel. He tells them to go um, tell the disciples that he was resurrected. Look at verse 11 of Luke 24. So they go and they tell the apostles. Verse 11 says, And their words seem to them as idle tales, and they believe them not. So the disciples, the apostles, they don't, they don't believe them. Verse 12, Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. Now here's where we actually, after all of these things, we catch up in John 20, basically like verse number 2. Is where, you know, all of these things have happened. To, to the point where we're at now in John 20. Because that's where we see, it was Mary Magdalene and all the women that go and they tell the apostles, and by and large, they're just like, what are you talking about? What, you, you know, what are you crazy ladies thinking? You know, what do you mean Jesus isn't there? And they think like an idle tale, that they're just making stuff up. And, um, but Peter gets up. It says here Peter, but we know that it's Peter and John. Both of them run to the, to the tomb to see, to to figure out what are they talking about you know they, they hear this and they're they're um, they want to know what's going on so let's go back to John 20 because all those events happen between verses 1 and 2 verse 1 says the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher and see it the stone taken away from the sepulcher and then in verse 2 then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. Now I'll stop here real quick because it's, it's interesting. From the events that we already saw happen, the angel told the ladies that Christ was risen and he gave them this message to go tell them that he's risen from the dead and that he's going to meet him in Galilee. I think we saw that, um, yeah, that he goeth before you into Galilee and there shall you see him as he said unto you. So he, he tells them this and that Jesus is going to meet up with them. But look what Mary says unto Peter. She says, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher in verse 2 and we know not where they have laid him. So even though she was already told by the angel, she doesn't believe. She, she doesn't believe what he's saying. Maybe she didn't even know that he was an angel. I don't know. But she's still under this impression that someone came and they took the body of Jesus and they laid him somewhere else and they're not telling us where he is because that's what she went and told Peter and, and John. She didn't tell them. The angel said he's risen and he's going to meet you in Galilee, right? She doesn't tell them that. And... All of these people, you know, the, the scripture, and we see that in this chapter, the scripture hadn't really been opened up to them. God reveals his word, and God has, throughout history, revealed his word 
in segments, in portions. He reveals more and he reveals a little bit more. And even when Jesus Christ was walking around his earth, Jesus was saying things that his disciples didn't fully understand at the time. And even his resurrection, you know, they're just going to start getting it now. They didn't get it before. They didn't get it when he told it to them. They didn't get it when he died on the cross. They didn't understand. But now they, they're going to start to get it. And even Mary, I mean, the angel tells her, but she still didn't get it. She's, she's not thinking about this. She's still thinking in terms of, well, someone took his body. And um, let's keep reading here. And so we see John outruns Peter. Peter and John both go running, and John runs faster. He gets to the sepulcher, but he stops outside of the, outside of the tomb, outside of the, the, the doorway, if you will. And Peter catches up, and then he goes in all the way, and he sees the clothing lying, he sees the, the, you know, the grave clothes, and then, um, and then John goes in after him. Now, um, after Peter and John leave, they see these things, and then they leave, we know that the, the next thing to happen in, the, in this story, in the events, is Jesus appearing to Mary Magdalene. And we could see in Mark 16, if you want to flip back, keep your finger in John 20. Mark 16 and verse 9. Mark 16, 9 says, Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. So very clearly, the Bible is telling us the first person he appeared to is Mary Magdalene. And that's why the, in John 20, it singles out Mary Magdalene because we're going to see that, that, um, that interaction with, with Jesus and Mary in John 20. So flip back to John 20 because now the other accounts, when you read them, Matthew and Mark and Luke, they'll have the next thing happening is Jesus appearing to other people because it doesn't record this interaction with Mary. But we see in Mark 16, it says that he first appeared unto Mary Magdalene. So that's the first, we know, you know, you could piece all these things together when you, when you look at them all and lay them out side by side. You can, you can get the order of events. And um, now Jesus appeared to a lot of people the first day of the week too. It's, it's kind of amazing when you see how many times he does appear. He was, I mean, he was doing a lot, he was pretty busy on, on the day of his resurrection. Um, we're going to see here all the, all the things that he did because he he was appearing and he was he was making himself known. I he was a number of 500. Yes, at once. There was there was above 500 at once in, in one place, and that was during the course, not just the first day though. So there there was a span of time where Jesus was making himself known and visible to people, and even up to you know above 400 or 500 at one time. Um, he had been seen by lots of people, but even just the very, very first day on that, on that first day of the week, that Sunday, if you will, he was, he was making himself known to various disciples. Let's go back and keep reading in John 20. Let's look at verse number 11. Well, you know what? Let's, before we get into what he did with, with, um, into his interaction with Mary, let's look at verse number Let's read the verses about Peter and John getting there. Look at verse number four. It says, So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, lying yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Now, you know, I, I can't say this for a fact, but I, when I read this and hear this, I envision, you know, he rose from the dead, literally, and, and all of his clothes were in one place, but then I could, I could picture Jesus, you know, sitting up and taking the, the, the head part off and throwing that down over by himself because he literally, I mean, physically, his body came back. The body that was laying in that tomb came back to life. So he had all these grave clothes on him and he, he came and got out of them. And um, when he rose from the dead, and it says the, the, the face part was, was 
wrapped, it was wrapped together and it was in a place by itself. So they see these things. It says, then went in also that other disciple. So then John joins Peter, which came first to the sepulcher and he saw and believed. This is when they're starting to, to understand a little bit more. So that's when it says that John believed. He saw these things and it, and it clicked that Jesus had risen, that he's not there anymore. Because you know, they didn't just move the body. If someone came to move the body, why would all the grave clothes still be there? They're not going to want to unwrap the grave clothing to move them somewhere else and to transport them after three days. They would have left it intact. With a hundred pounds of the stuff that they put on. The, the embalming. Place, and it was as hard. He literally arose. It's right. He, he, he came up and, there, and it's a miracle. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. He came back and, and, he, and he arose out of that and um, so we see that the clothes were lying there. This grave clothing was lying there. And um, it says in verse number 9, For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So as yet, this says they still didn't know the scripture. They didn't, they didn't understand the scripture that he needs to rise again from the dead. Um, verse number 10, Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. So they leave, Peter and John leave, but verse number 11 says, But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. So Mary, sticks, Mary Magdalene sticks behind there, or she goes back with them, and she goes back there, and she's, she's crying, she's upset, she's weeping. It says, And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. Now this is amazing because Peter and John were just there. And they were in the sepulcher. They didn't see anybody in there. Now all of a sudden Mary's still there, and she looks. She stoops down and looks in there, and now there's someone in there again. And um, it says in verse 12, And see it two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. So first she sees the two angels and she's just really upset. She's in tears. They're talking to her and they, you know, um, why are you crying? They're like, well, they, they, they took away my Lord. I don't know where he is. She's, you know, she's really upset that they moved, that someone came and moved the body. And, um, you know, it's really upsetting. And she sees Jesus and doesn't even recognize him, doesn't understand that it's him. And I think that part of the reason for this is because they didn't believe yet. They didn't understand. Their eyes weren't fully open to, to the fact that Jesus rose again from the dead. But regardless of the reason, she didn't, she didn't know that it was him when she saw him. Verse 15, so then Jesus interacts and says, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. So she's still, I mean, he, he talks to her and she still doesn't know. She thinks he's a gardener. She's like, look, just let me know where you put him and, I, and I'll take care of him. You know, let, let me know. So Jesus saith unto her, verse 16, Mary. So all he had to say was just, just say her, her name. And as soon as she, he said her name, it clicked with her. And it says, she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Now, this is really interesting that... Um, you know, she, she knew it was Jesus then, and then he speaks to her and tells her, you know, okay, don't touch me. Because he hasn't yet gone into heaven. He, so, I'd kind of like to know where he was <laughs> when he rose from the grave. Like, you know, and these people are coming, the women were there, and Jesus was nowhere to be found, but he hadn't gone into heaven yet. Um, but, but then he, he makes himself visible and seen to Mary, and he says, okay, don't touch me, but I'm going to go ascend to my father. And um, we know that this is the first thing that happens. Besides when it said that he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, um, 
in Matthew 28, you don't have to turn there, I'll just read it for you. Matthew 28, 7 says, And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him, lo, I have told you. That was when the angel was telling them to go tell the disciples that he was risen. Verse 8 says, And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. So in Matthew, that's the order of events. It just skips over Jesus meeting with Mary Magdalene. And we know that this had to happen afterwards because it says that they came and held him by the feet. Now, Jesus told Mary not to touch him because he hadn't ascended into heaven yet. So by this point, Jesus has already been to heaven and come back down again now in order for them to be able to, to touch him and to hold him. And, um, you know, there's very good reason for that. You think about the, the Jesus was clean. He was pure. And when he went to go up into heaven, and I think the reason why he couldn't be touched is because he, he didn't want to be defiled just by, by human hands, by, by the hands of a servant, by anything, before he went up as, you know, the, the, the sacrifice that was made to, to sprinkle his blood before the mercy seat um, for the sacrifice that he made. Because, I mean, this was right after he ascended out of hell and went into heaven. He still needed to, to remain um, pure, I guess, in, in one sense of not being touched, not being handled until he went to heaven. And then he came back down, of course, and was allowing people to touch him and because they, they held him at his feet and worshipped him. Now, the other thing I want to point out here. And I've, I've mentioned this in the John chapter 3 sermon because the false versions of the Bible in John, in John 3 were in John 3.13 it says, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. In the King James it says, And no man hath ascended up to heaven. In the new versions, the modern version will say, and no man has ever gone into heaven. Okay, two completely different things. Because Jesus' ascension into heaven, Jesus literally ascended into heaven of his own accord, of his own power, of his own might. Other people in the past, when, when people have been brought into heaven, they're always carried by angels. There's a chariot came and, and, and caught up Elijah. Mm -hmm. and brought him into heaven. It wasn't them like levitating, if you will, and ascending up into heaven. But we see here in these words in John 20, 17, he says, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brother and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father. He said, I am, you know, like, like this is what I'm doing. I am ascending unto my Father. He's not being carried there by an angel. He's not, he's not a, arriving there any other way. He's ascending, which um, just... You know, again, this, this verbiage here of what he's saying lines up with John 3, and it is the accurate translation. And to say that no one has ever gone into heaven is just a lie. It's just simply not true. Because what about all the believers that had died prior to Jesus Christ? And, and you know, for him to say no man has ever gone into heaven, that's just that's simply not true. We have we have two accounts of people in the Old Testament ascent, you know, going to heaven or being in heaven. So, um, you know, these, stay away from these false versions. They're, uh, they're just there to deceive you. But um, So we have this account with, with Mary, and he, she doesn't touch him, but, but he needs to go and ascend into heaven. And so we saw in, in Matthew 28, as I mentioned, It says that as they went to tell his disciples. So what I'm guessing here, and again, there's not a contradiction because Jesus then meets, meets them as they went to tell his disciples. Um, this was the women that were being told to go tell the disciples that Jesus rose again from the dead. They told John and Peter who went running to the grave, but... They probably weren't all in one place. They had to continue going to tell the disciples. So they, they probably reached John and Peter first who ran in the grave and Mary went back. But while the other ladies are still going to spread the news and, and continue to tell the disciples, 
then Jesus already appeared to Mary, Jesus ascended up into heaven, and then Jesus comes back and he meets them while they're still telling the other disciples as they're on their way. And he says, all hail, and they came and held him by the feet. And then after this, Luke 24 describes how he met with two disciples in the way to another village, and they didn't recognize him. We're not going to read the whole story on that one, but that's another interesting one. So he, he meets up with two of the disciples, and basically the, he says, you know, like, you know, hey, what's going on? Like, why are you guys so sad? And they're like, have you been living under a rock? Don't you know? Like, like Jesus came and he died and you know and all this other stuff and and they're saying now like the women are saying that his body's not there and all this other stuff so Jesus expounds the scripture unto them and they don't recognize it's Jesus so here's this guy that just kind of meet they're they're walking down the road they're going to this village yeah. and Jesus just just meets up with them hey guys how you doing you know and and joins in their group and <laughs> continues on the road with them and he opens up the scripture and it says he he expounded the scripture on them starting at Moses so he goes all the way back to Moses and the prophets and showing them how Jesus Christ needed to die and to be crucified and to rise again from the dead. So then they invite him to stay with them. They're like, urging, okay, well, come on, you know, stay with us. We're getting here. And they realized who he was at the moment when he blessed the bread. He, he broke the bread and blessed it. And they were like, it's Jesus. And then gone. And he... And he, and he vanishes away from them. And so then they go back to Jerusalem because that's where they were coming out of and they go into his village. So then they go back and then that same day again Jesus appears unto him. So he has appeared unto Mary. He appeared unto the other women when they were going to tell the disciples. He has appeared unto uh, these disciples that were along the way. And then he also appears unto them all again that evening. So again, remember, it's the first day of the week. It's a Sunday evening. And it says, look at John 20, verse 19. Verse 19 of John 20 says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. So now we see another appearance of Jesus Christ. And it's amazing because... Um, the, the spiritual body that Jesus is in now is no longer bound by what we consider to be the, the physical elements of this world. Because it's very clear to say the doors were shut. And Jesus wasn't there before. And they're gathered together. But now all of a sudden, Jesus is just standing in the midst of him. He's right there. And um, the same way he was able to depart from the other two disciples after he broke the bread. They realized who he was. It's like, oh, Jesus. And then he's gone. You know, they're, he's, he's able to do this now. He's not bound by the same physical. And, and you know, that's kind of neat to think about that. Because we're going to have glorified bodies too. Now, our current bodies are flesh and blood. And the Bible says, you know, flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But Jesus isn't flesh and blood. He is only, he is flesh and bone but not flesh and blood. And there's a big distinction there because the Bible says, you know, the blood is the life thereof. But with our new bodies, the blood isn't the life thereof. God is. God provides us the life and the light. And He is our eternal life. He's who sustains us. We don't need the fleshly blood anymore. Um, Jesus Christ will provide the life for us. But apparently with these new bodies, the, the physical world is a little bit different in the way that it behaves with your body, which is, which is pretty neat. Yeah, there's a molecular change, and science has proved that with that change, you have the ability to do that. Yeah, well, that, that's what we see in the Bible, yeah. right? So, so even if science didn't say that, right, who cares? Because, because we see that this is the case, especially with Jesus Christ. And we know that, that we are going to receive glorified bodies that would be similar to his and in, 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 in his image. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be neat. I, I don't know what, what it's going to be like. I'm excited. But it's, it, it is very exciting to think about that. But so here we see it's, it's the Sunday evening service, right? Because the, the disciples are, are assembled together. And it says, that, um, it says that they were assembled. And it says that the doors were shut for fear of the Jews. Because they had, I mean, they had just killed Jesus. So now they're like, okay, we're still going to meet. We're still going to have church. We're still going to congregate together. 
but it's not quite as open as it used to be because now they're facing all the persecution and, and now it's serious. I mean, now they, they actually, I mean, they put Christ to death. They put the, the leader to death. So it's, a, it's troubling times for them. But we see here it's, it's, it's a Sunday evening service. And honestly, this is one of the reasons why we have a Sunday evening service. Um, you see that the disciples were gathered together. They assembled on the first day of the week. They were here to assemble together in the evening. And um, when Jesus was there, and on, quite honestly, I, I, um, you know, I don't think it's a sin to not go to all the services that church holds. I, I'm not, you know, I don't take that stand on it. I don't think you could find that in the Bible. The only, the only way it's a sin is if you forsake the assembling of ourselves together. So if you just stop going to church, you're forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. That is a sin. But, you know, whether a person comes once a week or maybe twice a week or whatever, you know, I'm not going to say it's a sin, but I will say this, is that, you know, as the day gets closer, we need church more and more. And you never know what you're going to learn. You never know what's going to happen on any given day. So I encourage everybody to come to all the services that we hold. Um, I mean, here, Thomas missed out, right? Because Thomas wasn't among them at this, at this meeting. And think about, um, and, and this happens so many times. There's a lot of people who, um, you know, we all have our own things we have to deal with. <clears throat> we all have our own struggles. And we all have different sermons and different truths from the Bible that we need to hear maybe more than others. So it might be something that I'm struggling with or, or something that I could just really use. Even if I'm not struggling, but just something that I need to hear from God's Word that really is going to affect me quite a bit. And I, I've found this that with, with certain people, I've, I've noticed this in the past, when they haven't been very consistent coming to church, that... One day when like, even normally they might be there, they're not there, and then there's this sermon preached, and it's like, man, that would have been perfect that they would have just been here to hear that. And it happens quite a bit, and, and you never know which service is really going to hit home to you and is really going to help you out a lot. So I always encourage everyone to come to all the services. That's why we have the services that we do have. And, you know, they're all different. We're not like these churches that do the same sermon, you know, three or four times in a day. And just to accommodate for whatever and have a contemporary service and all this other stuff, but all the preaching is the same. No, every single service is different. We're preaching new truths out of the Bible. So, you know, they're all important. And... and, and um, you never know what you're going to miss when you miss out on church. And um, obviously, we all have different things going on in our lives, different schedules and whatever. And that's why I made a point to say it's not a sin to not come to all three services. I just think that there's something valuable to learn at all of the services. And you don't want to end up missing something that, that um, you could have otherwise, otherwise gotten. And here, you know, Thomas missed a very exciting evening service with, <laughs> with Jesus Christ showing up in the midst of them. But let's, let's keep reading here. Look at, look at verse number 20 of John 20. It says, And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. So he proves, I mean, he, he's like, look, it's me. Look at the holes in my hands and, and look at my side. You know, it's me. And he says, and they're glad, right? They're relieved. They see that and, and they're amazed, I'm sure. But um, so then Jesus gives them this directive. He says, okay, first, peace be unto you. As my Father sent me. So what did, what did the Father send Jesus to do? Because God the Father sent Jesus with a mission. He was sent to seek and to save that which was lost, right? He was sent to do all these different things, to minister unto people, to help people, and ultimately, though, to get people saved. That was his mission. He says, so even as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. They're receiving these orders directly from Jesus Christ and saying, look, now I'm sending you out. This is what I want you to do. And that commandment, is, applies to us just as much as that applies to the apostles at the time when, uh, from that very first day of his resurrection, this commandment continues until Christ comes back again. 
This is, you know, his command hasn't changed. He has sent us. If you're saved again, God is sending you out and he wants you to preach the gospel to every creature, which is why that is the Great Commission. That's why we see that in Mark 16 and Matthew 28, that basically after Jesus appears and he's talking with his disciples and he sees people, before he goes back up into heaven, that's like his last thing that he says unto them. Like, okay, this is what you need to do. It's the first thing that he says to them publicly, right, here that we see um, besides his, his individual conversations, he speaks to the group and he's saying, okay, I'm gonna, I, my father sent me, now I'm sending you. And it's the last thing that he says before he goes back up into heaven and where, where he is right now, sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Now, <clears throat> let's keep reading here. Verse number 22 says, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. This is all keeping in context here. He, he says, I'm sending you. And then he says, Receive the Holy Ghost. This is the, the moment that believers were indwelled with the Holy Ghost. This is a new thing. Believers of the Old Testament did not have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of them. They would get the Holy Ghost upon them. Um, when you look at, read about Samson, you read about the judges, you read about Saul, you read about King David, and over and over again you'll see the Spirit of the Lord came upon them. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson, and he had all the strength. The Spirit of the Lord came upon them. And yes, the Spirit of the Lord helped them to do great things and mighty things, but it was upon them. Now, we still have that today. That hasn't gone away. The Spirit of God can come upon you to do mighty things. But what we have today that they didn't have before is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We have the Comforter that they didn't have before that is with us, that's in our hearts from the moment you get saved. And this is very clear in John chapter 20 that when he breathes on them, that's when they received the Holy Ghost. There's lies out there today, because this is way before Acts chapter 2. But the Pentecostals today will try to have you believe that you don't get the Spirit of God until you get baptized. And that simply is not true. It's a lie straight out of hell, because we see here, Jesus Christ gave them the Holy Ghost way before Acts chapter 2. And that is the moment you see, is the moment you believe in Christ. And I don't want to get into that too much, because just um, there's no point... That's a whole sermon in and of itself. But um, here is when believers, and from here on forward, believers receive that, that Holy Spirit the moment that you get saved. Now, he sends them out, right? His message is to send them out, and he gives them, he equips them with what they need to be sent out with, which is the Holy Ghost. We need to be walking in the Spirit in order to fulfill what Christ has sent us to do. If you go out to win souls and you're not walking in the Spirit and you're in the flesh, you're not going to do anything. You are going to see zero souls saved because we need the power of the Holy Ghost in order to work with us, in order to pierce the hearts of those who are listening with God's Word and that power of the Holy Ghost to reach through, to lighten up their understanding, and that they could receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, through our words, but we need that power of the Holy Ghost. That's why he says, right after he says, receive ye the Holy Ghost, verse 23, he says, colon, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. So this is why we have that power, essentially for forgiveness of sins. Now, it's not us doing the forgiving, right, of, of saying, okay, all of your sins are forgiven because I said so. No, but we're providing them with the salvation with the good news, with the gospel of Jesus Christ for them to make that decision for God to save their soul. But we need to be doing that under the power and the direction of the Holy Ghost that's inside of us. And that's what, why he's given us that equipment, that, that capability to go out and do this great work. We need to be walking in the Spirit. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 24 says, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, 
We have seen the Lord, but he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now that's a, that's a bad attitude to have as a Christian. We ought never to have that type of an attitude where saying that I'm not, well, you know, even though all of your other brothers and sisters in Christ are telling you, look, we saw Jesus Christ. He's risen from the dead. And he spoke to us every single day. Nope, I'm not going to believe it unless I have physical evidence, unless I have physical proof. Well, let's see what happens because Jesus actually, you know, speaks to him here. In verse 26, it says, And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. So this time Thomas is with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut. Again, the doors are all shut, and Jesus is there and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. So his first order of business, he, he approaches Thomas and says, Okay, look, Thomas, here, give me your hands. And Thomas probably got to be a little freaked out by now. He's saying like, he's probably regretting saying, Look, unless I do this, then I'm not going to believe, because now Jesus is saying, Okay, here, take my hand, Thomas. Here, feel the holes in my hands, Thomas. Take, give me your hand. And he thrusts it into his side. Now, don't be faithless anymore, Thomas, but believing. And, um, and that's what he does. But look at, look at Thomas' reaction. Verse 28 says, And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. And I brought this up in the past when I preached on, um, on Easter about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But this is very important because we see again, and this is a great, a great section. If you want to take notes, if you ever talk to a Jehovah's false witness, that tries to, you know, they don't believe, first of all, in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. They don't believe that he died on the cross. They think they died on a, on a torture stake. There's so many things that you could prove false about what they believe from this section of Scripture right here with Jesus' interaction with Thomas. They also don't believe that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. This is why they are not saved. This is why they're a cult and they, they, they're, they shouldn't even be called Christian because they have nothing to do with, Christ, with true Christianity. And um, they don't believe Jesus is being God of flesh. They don't believe he died on a cross. They don't believe he bodily rose from the dead in his body. They believe it was a spiritual resurrection, not his body. But my friend, that's the gospel. That Jesus died, was buried, and rose again from the dead. That is the gospel. They don't believe the gospel. But when Thomas, if Jesus Christ was not Lord and he was not God, then wouldn't he have to rebuke Thomas and say, No, Thomas, there is only one God and it's not me, Thomas. Don't you call me God. But is that what Jesus did? Let's see what Jesus' answer was after, he, after Thomas says, My Lord and my God. Look at verse number 29. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Believed what? Believed that he is his Lord and God. Jesus confirms what Thomas just said, My Lord and my God. Absolutely, you're right, Thomas. Because he is. Jesus Christ is your Lord and is God. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. It's so power, such a powerful exchange here that we see between Thomas and Jesus Christ. And, you know, we ought not to have, and that's why he says, you're, you know, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Anyone who doesn't have to see this physical evidence, but you can believe because you hear God's word and you can just trust it for what it says. I said, you know, Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. I believe it. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh because the Bible says so. I believe it. Jesus bodily arose, not just in spirit. Obviously, they were able to handle him. They were able to take it, literal physical hold on him and it was his same body because why would he have the holes in his hands and the, the piercing in his side if it wasn't his body? Because that's another thing I've heard is that they'll try to say, oh, well, yeah, he appeared in a body, but they will say it's not the body of Jesus Christ. Well, what, is God trying to deceive him with, with holes and piercings from a different body? No. We know that that's false because Jesus Christ said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. And he spake of the temple of his body. 
His body rose again from the dead. His body had the holes in his hands. His body had the piercing. When they, and when he rose again, he had him touch him and say, feel the holes in my hands. Feel the, the, you know, the wound in my side. And um, he says in Luke 24, 39, you have to turn here. He says, behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. He's saying, look, I'm, it's not just some spiritual resurrection. He physically rose again from the grave. That's why his grave clothes were, 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 were lying off and, you know, and still there where his body had been. That's why he had the holes in his hands. Look, a spirit doesn't have, and that, you know, it's important to know too, spirits don't have flesh and bones. That's a different realm. It's a different, they don't have a body. Jesus Christ had a body. Physically arose again from the dead. And um, well, I'm not even going to get into that topic. It's a whole other topic for another day about spirits not having bodies. Because people have this crazy doctrine about um, the sons of God being angels and that devils went in unto humans. But it's like and none of it makes sense because the Bible says he made his angels ministering spirits. Jesus just said spirits don't have flesh and bones. How is in the world is a spiritual entity going to reproduce with a physical fleshly and it doesn't it makes zero sense whatsoever don't get sucked into these bizarre doctrines and jewish fables and whatever they are that are that that are you know deceiving people being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine um but again i don't i don't even want to get into that subject um it's <laughs> it's just craziness well, let's keep reading here. Let's look at verse number 30 of John 20. We're almost done. We're wrapping up. It says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. So Jesus did a lot of other... We see in this book, right? In the book of John, he records lots of stuff. He records lots of miracles. He just, just signs that he was who he was. All of these different things he did. It says... He did many other signs in the presence of his disciples. They're not even written in this book. But look at verse number 31. It says, But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. So here we see the whole purpose, really, literally, of the book of John is that we might believe and believing we might have life through his name. This is one of the reasons why I think John probably contains, um, first of all, just the, the book of John is the most different from the other gospels. You got Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And when you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they have a lot of similarities. And John kind of has just, the, the, the accounts and the stories in John aren't really recorded any in, in any of the other ones. It's, I think it's the most different. Now, obviously, there's a lot, there's overlap between all of them, and, and you're going to have that. But I think you get the most, I don't know what I'll call it, new content, a different content out of John than any of the rest of them. But, um, you know, the, the reason what he says here in John 20, that these things are written that you might believe, I think that's also the reason why I use the, the, the book of John quite a bit when preaching the gospel. There's so many great salvation truths. There's so many truths about Jesus Christ and his, you know, I and my Father are one. We, I mean, we're almost done with this series on John, but, but we saw all of this great, dense truth about Jesus Christ and who he was and, and believing on him to be saved over and over. And salvation is just rampant in this book. Which makes sense if this book was written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. He said, we wrote all these things so that you could understand that, yes, Jesus is the Christ. And they reference all the scriptures that, that he fulfilled and the prophecy saying, this is the Christ. Look, we're recording this. I'm a witness to these events. I'm telling you that this is true so that you can believe that, yes, Jesus is the Christ. And... Um, The last point about that is that, um, you know, people get so hung up on this doctrine of repentance and repenting of your sins and you have to do all this stuff to be saved. But it's interesting to note that the word repent is not even used in the book of John. Not one time. Now, the Bible does use the word repent and it also associates repenting with salvation. 
But in context, you're always changing your belief from a false belief unto belief on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is where our salvation comes in. Um, it's, it's your belief. It's believing on God, believing on Christ to save you from your sins. It's not about turning over a new leaf. It's not about getting all the sin out of your life in order to be saved. That is not what the Bible teaches, which is why that's not even found in the book of John, the book that claims to be a book written for people to believe. And because it's written in this, I, I would suggest when you give the gospel to people, when you talk to people, hey, go to the book of John. There's lots of verses in the book of John. John chapter 3 is huge. Not just John 3.16, but he talks to Nicodemus. He talks about being born again. You can explain being born again. John chapter 3, John 3, like, I mean, John 3.36, John 3.16, 17, 18, you know, it talks about believing. Um, John 5.24, I, I almost never leave a door without giving somebody John 5.24 if they'll let me. Talking about, you know, believing for eternal life and that um, you've passed from death unto life. Oh, there's so much great truth in the book of John. And it was written so that we can believe on Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for your words and for the great truths that we have, dear Lord, and for the, the glorious resurrection from the dead, dear God, to, to complete our salvation. That, that it wasn't over, you know, it wasn't over when Jesus Christ just died on the cross because he had to come back from the dead. He had to conquer death and hell and have the keys to death and hell in order to save us from our sins, dear Lord. We thank you so much for that loving sacrifice that was made for us, dear God. Um, we're thankful for, for this. and We pray that you would please just continue to teach us, help us to grow and to learn more and to study more of your word, dear God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.